Welcome, everyone. It is good to be able to study the Word of God together tonight. I am blessed to see such dedication to the things of God that is demonstrated by your seeking out God's knowledge written for us. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that this ministry is supported by viewers like you, as well as by purchasing products that I'm currently selling over on my website. Links for both will be in the description below. Please join me in a word of prayer. God, as we open your word and read its message, we declare that we believe in its validity. We accept the truths that it proclaims. We hear the message of salvation and its conviction upon us. And we thank you for the blessing it is to each one of us. May our hearts be open. May our ears hear your voice. May our lips praise your name. And, we, and may we leave changed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Today we will be letter, reading the letter to the church in Pergamum, where we will learn about the church's struggle against the forces of darkness. Unlike Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum was not a port city, but was located about 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea and was actually located about 100 miles north of Ephesus, with Smyrna being located between the two. Nor was Pergamum on any of the major trade routes. Yet, as its ancient capital, Pergamum was considered Asia's greatest city. By the time John wrote this section of Revelation, Pergamum had been Asia's capital for almost 250 years. And it still survives today as the Turkish city of Bergama. Pergamum was home to a huge library rivaling the library in Alexandria and only coming second to that library. Because of this, Pergamum was an important center of both culture and learning. It was also an important center of worship for four of the main Greco-Roman deities, Athena, Asclepius, Dionysus, and Zeus. But overshadowing the worship of all these deities was Pergamum's devotion to the cult of emperor worship. Pergamum built the first temper, temple devoted to emperor worship in Asia in honor of Kaiser Augustus, or Caesar Augustus, sorry. Fallout New Vegas, love it. Later they built two more temples for other emperors. It became the cult, the center of emperor worship in the province. And there, more than in any other city in Asia, Christians were in danger of harm from this cult. Elsewhere, they were primarily in danger on the one day per year they were required to offer sacrifices to the emperor, whereas in Pergamum, they were in danger constantly. It is likely that the martyr Antipas was executed for refusing to worship the emperor. The church of Pergamum was one that lived and served in the shadow of Satan's empire. The dynasty of which had its headquarters in that city. Let's go ahead and read this letter. The message to the church in Pergamum. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols, and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In other translations, it says, make war against them. Verse 17, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, 
and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Notice with me the introduction Jesus uses to introduce himself to Pergamum. The one who has the sharp double-edged sword. In ancient, high, in ancient times, the highest symbol of authority was the sword. It represented the greatest authority the people knew. It represented absolute authority. His, his introduction here leads one to believe that God was not all that happy with the church. But let's see what Jesus had to say to them. First, we come to the dedication of this church. Notice it. Here was a church in the shadow of Satan's throne, and Jesus notes their dedication. Imagine their struggle as they live under that shadow of the headquarters of Satan. This headquarters is a strategic place where Satan can best use his influence to affect mankind. And in this time, Jesus tells them, you remain true to my name. To remain true to the name of Jesus means they were loyal to him totally. The name is a symbol of Jesus. That is a heck of a lot of dedication of this church to remain faithful in the face of emperor worship cults, four different deity cults, and Satan's own machination against the church to try and destroy it, because we all know Satan comes to do three things, steal, kill, and destroy. And he will do that wherever he can, and the church is the only bastion of hope against those forces. So the fact that they remain true is a testament and the fact that Jesus acknowledges that is a testament. But then Jesus goes on to say, you did not renounce your faith in me. And, you know, that, well, I guess it's still the same point. Sorry, trying to read my notes. This means that they had not denied the purpose for which Jesus came, and they had not turned their back on the gospel. Despite the difficult circumstances in which they found themselves, the believers at Pergamum, courageously maintain their faith in Jesus Christ. That is a high calling. That is something that we all need to answer the calling for. But then we have the detente, which means an easing of, an easing of friction between two parties. Let me tell you this. There was a problem in Pergamum. It is a problem that exists today as well perhaps more strongly than ever in history. Notice this detente. It, it means compromising so as not to muddy the waters. The church was faithful. It was. They believed in Jesus. It was a strong church, an orthodox church. They had did not denied his faith, but they were tolerating false views. They had not... What had... What should have been expelled from the church had been tolerated, and the church itself did not hold false doctrine, but it held fellowship with those who did have false doctrine. This was the thing that Jesus was directly addressing and attacking in this church, was that while they themselves had not fallen to false doctrine, they were tolerating those who were bringing that doctrine in that could possibly lead others astray, especially the new believers. First of all, what did they allow in their fellowship? They allowed the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam in Numbers 22 and 23 was called by a king to curse Israel. Balaam did not try to change the theology or curse the nation. He just encouraged them to compromise the purposes that God had for them. He polluted this people socially and spiritually. The end result is seen in verse 14, a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and it resulted in the eating of things sacrificed to idols and committing immorality. They taught that orthodoxy gave license to sin. Believe the right thing and you can do whatever you want. 
Notice the problem. The church believed the right things, but they tolerated those who had doctrines of Balaam and false teachings. A modern example of this would be, um, I hate to throw anyone under the bus, but just ca Catholics as a whole, you see a lot of, you see within Catholic faith, you see a lot of people that will, um, and I'm not saying this is every single one. I have known Catholics that are faithful and, and do everything they can every day to f follow and serve Jesus. But you see some people who believe that the way the Catholics do things, you can sin for six days of the week and then go in on Sunday for confession and be good for the next week. And that's not, God never intended a church to tolerate error. And we have a similar situation in our churches today. We don't want to cause waves with the world over issues like homosexuality or abortion. So we will allow false teaching to enter in and adjust our doctrine to keep everyone happy rather than sticking to our doctrine so that people might be saved. That is the problem with the uh, with the church today is we don't we we don't have direction. Notice the direction Jesus gives them. Repent. He was not talking to the people who had the doctrine of Balaam. He was not talking to the people who had the doctrine of worshiping idols or worshiping the emperor. He was speaking to the church. He was telling them to repent. But how? How could the church repent? They were not guilt. They were not guilty of believing those things right. Jesus essentially says to the church, exclude those people from fellowship. Do not give them false security. They were wrong. They were destroying what the church believed so the church should remove them. He said to the church, exercise discipline. Do we, re do we realize sometimes the danger of someone who fights against the things of God? The danger of someone in the fellowship who stands for what contradicts the doctrine and gospel of Jesus. He said, you as a church had better repent and act on this matter, or I will come and work against them. Basically, you take care of them, or I will. You know, I mean, the fact is, if we do not, if we do not work to exercise our authority as the people of God to state, no, this is what the Bible says. This is what Jesus says. This is what we believe. We're not going back on it. We're not compromising it. Then we will inevitably and inadvertently find ourselves entertaining and welcoming false doctrine in our congregations. And that's not a condemnation on anybody. That's just a reality of life because Satan comes and he perverts that which is truth. He perverts that which is life and light and good, and he gives us falseness. And if we do not contradict that, if we do not combat that or uh, uh, confront the falseness, we will not find truth. We will not be speaking truth, and we will not be living truth. So, he promises, though, he promises delight to the ones who follow him, though, for the ones who repent. He talks about the hidden manna. The hidden manna typifies the spiritual food provided by God in his word. He's talking about individual feeding, not a church function. Manna was divinely supplied, but had to be humanly gathered. God gave it, but the people had to gather it. God's not going to spoon feed you. God's not going to spoon feed you when it comes to your own personal spiritual growth. I myself am learning this on a daily basis, almost repetitively, because I'm like, wow, look at this. If I'd started this years ago, I would have actually been growing spiritually a lot better. It, okay, it's like, all right, it's like you want to be healthy, but you don't want to eat. So instead of 
gaining muscle and gaining good things, all you're doing is you're losing weight. You're turning into a walking, talking skeleton with skin stretched over, and you're wondering why you're not healthy, while you're not feeding yourself. In the same way, spiritually, you have to feed yourself. The pastor can only do so much. Uh, Sunday school can only do so much. Gathering with the brethren can only do so much, but if you're not doing something too, it all doesn't really matter, because all that is, is formula. The Bible speaks about meat and milk. Milk is the stuff you get on Sunday mornings. Meat is the stuff you get when you go in and dive in further on Monday afternoon or Wednesday evening or whenever you do, you know? It's about you taking the initiative after they've given you the first step, you know? And then, you know, we talk about the stone, the white stone. It says, let me go ahead and go back and actually read the, the verse. It says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone. And on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. So what is the stone? What is the stone? Well, there are many ideas as to what it is. The whiteness represents the purity and holiness of God. The new name represents the name that a believer receives in Christ, and sometimes a white stone was given to a man after a trial to symbolize that they were not guilty. Or sometimes after a battle, the, given, the victor was given a white stone which represented victory. Or sometimes a stone was given to signify citizenship, especially back in the Roman times, you know? When we apply that to our Christian faith, it forms a beautiful picture. Jesus gives us a promise that we will be given uh, a new name, a new identity, new citizenship in him. Not in ourselves, not in this world, because we need to realize we are dual, dual citizens. Two, we're citizens of earth, but we're also citizens of heaven. And so if we realize that, and we realize that we are primarily citizens of heaven and secondarily citizens of earth, then we will act as if, God's will needs to be done here as it is in heaven. As the prayer that he gives us says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. You know, I mean, it's a wonderful thing. But it must be very clear that the church must tolerate those who will lower the standards of our truth. It's not a question of holding the truth. Pergamum did that. We must rightly apply the truth with hope. We must rightly apply that truth to the point to where we are giving the truth to those who need it. As a church tonight, we face the same choice that Pergamum did. We can repent and receive all the blessings of God, or we can refuse to repent and face the terrifying reality of having the Lord Jesus Christ declare war on us. We need to remain true to the word and never compromise our position, because when we do, we invite judgment on us. Please pray with me. Lord, tonight I, I pray that we would learn from the lesson of Pergamum. I pray that we would be a people that stand in the face of adversity on the solid rock, holding true to the word of God that you have graciously given us. It is my heart's desire tonight that we would never allow ourselves to come into a position where we would even consider compromising your word. Lord, be with us now as we go out in this week. Watch over us and equip us for the word that lies ahead, for the work that lies ahead as well. For these things we ask in your son's heavenly name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. I hope you have, a, you have a blessed week, and I hope you take this message that we need to be of the truth and that we need to hold to the truth, and you take it out there and you apply that. Tell someone out there what the truth is and who our Jesus truly is. Thank you. Have a wonderful night.